So a length L of a lossless transmission line, of course, is a two-port device. And like any two-port device, we can interpret it as an impedance transformer. We put a load in one end of the two-port um, uh, two network, and we find that there is an input impedance that is different than that load, generally speaking. And so we can say that two-port network transforms the load impedance back to a different impedance at the input. That's one interpretation. And we can then interpret interpret a length of transmission line in the same way. Certainly we know that the input impedance that we see at one end of the transmission line is going to be, generally speaking, much different than the load impedance attached to the other end. So this leads to the question, can we transform any arbitrary load impedance to any other arbitrary input impedance? Can we take a specific load impedance and transform it to any value we wish by selecting the right length of our transmission line? Well, it turns out that's not the case. Although we can transform ZL, the load impedance, to many different values of ZN, we can transform only to a limited number of all the overall possibilities of what that value of ZN could be. Specifically, we can transform ZL into any input impedance that lies on the um, uh, parametrically plotted reflection coefficient function on the complex gamma plane. If we start at a value of ZL and move up back up the line, plotting the reflection coefficient, in this case in a clockwise way, we strike a circular arc as we move around the complex gamma plane. Any point that we intersect with can be transformed from ZL to that point, but any point that isn't intersecting that contour, that circular arc, cannot be transformed by a transmission line from ZL to that point. So let's look at some examples of that on the next page with the Smith chart. So let's do an example. Let's arbitrarily pick some load impedance. Normalized, we'll say it has a real value of 0.5 and a imaginary value uh, reactance of 1.2. Mm -hmm. And so we look at the uh, requisite circles, contours there, and intersects at that point. And now we're going to plot the reflection coefficient function parametrically on the complex gamma plane, on the Smith chart. We're going to start at the end of the line where ZL is, 0.5 plus J1.2, and we're going to then move back up the transmission line. The index Z, position index Z, is decreasing when we do this, and therefore the reflection coefficient angle is decreasing, and therefore we are rotating with a circular arc in a clockwise manner around the complex gamma plane around the complex or around the Smith chart rather. And so we do this we notice that we intersect at quite a few number of points on the complex gamma plane. We intersect this point right here which corresponds to an impedance of 0.6 minus J12. It's minus because now we're down here in the capacitive region. Another point if we go further that is at 0.4 minus J1. <clears throat> Moving further still back up the line, we uh, intersect this point, this impedance, at 0.2, a real uh, resist a value of 0.2, and then further we go to a value of 0.3 um, J.7. And of course, this is I just put I just picked these points at random along the circle. At any point, we at every point on this contour, the circular contour, we intersect some impedance, and that impedance can be transferred, uh, transformed uh, with a proper length of a or with a transmission line from the load impedance uh, in this example of 0.5 plus J 1.2 to these input impedances. Any one of these can be transformed from our original load impedance. Of course, that means that any point on the complex gamma plane, any point on our Smith chart that doesn't lie on this green circle, that doesn't lie on the parametric plot of reflection coefficient from this load, cannot be transformed from this load ZL <coughs> to that um, uh, value. For example, let's look at the center of the Smith chart. We know the center of the Smith chart where gamma is equal to zero corresponds to an impedance of real part of one and an imaginary part of zero, the matched impedance. We cannot transform this value, 0.5, 
plus j 1.2 to a value of 1 plus j 0, a matched impedance, by using a length of transmission line, of lossless transmission line. So what determines the uh, input impedance? We have a specific load impedance and we uh, want to transform it to an input impedance. Let's say it is on that uh, parametric plot of the complex uh, or of the uh, reflection coefficient function. Uh, how do we uh, um, uh, set up a structure, uh, a physical structure, that transforms then that load impedance to that specific input impedance? Well. What that depends on is the length of the transmission line. By setting the physical length or electrical length of the transmission line to the proper value, then we can transform the load impedance to any of those points on that green circle, but only the points on that green circle. So, for example, let's say we wish to transform a load impedance into an input impedance of 0.6 minus j 1.2. That happens to be a point on that parametric plot. That happens to be a point on the green circle. So, we know that there's a length of transmission line that will transform that load to this specific input impedance. The question is, what is the length of that transmission line? So the transmission line length required to transform a load impedance of this value to an input impedance of this value uh, is, is easily determined from the Smith chart. We take our straight edge once again and, and draw a straight line from the center through ZL to the outer scale. And likewise, take our straight edge and draw a line from the center through the value of of Z in to the outer scale. The important thing to note is the um, um, electrical index um, for each of these two points. If we look at this index, and let's use the wavelengths toward load index, we find this point is about 0.35 lambda. If we go down here and look at the same index, again, making sure that we use the same wavelengths toward load, we find this value is about 0 0.160. Again, 0 0.35, 0 0.16, neither of these numbers have any relevance to us. The important thing is the difference between them. The difference between them is 0 0.193 lambda, and that is the length of the transmission line required to transform a load impedance of this value into an input impedance of this value. Now, in this case, I use the um, outer scale associated with wavelengths toward load. We could have instead have used the outer scale wavelengths toward generator. If we look up here at that scale, instead of getting a value of 0.35 uh, 0.353 uh, lambda, we find that we get a value of 0.147 lambda, a very different value. If we go down to this point on that same scale, on the wavelengths toward generator, and we look at the index there, the electrical index, we get a value of 0.340. Again, a very much different value than the 0.16 we had for using the other outer scale, the wavelengths toward load. But again, those two numbers don't make any difference. If we go through and we subtract now the value of 0.147 and the value of 0 0.340, we get a value once again of 0.193 lambda. And again, that is the length of the transmission line required to transform ZL into this ZN. So what is, this, what is the significance of this uh, impedance transformation? Um, uh, we can only transform a load impedance to uh, one of the impedances that map to a location on that green circle, on that parametric plot of, uh, of the reflection coefficient. And as a percentage, of course, there's a very small amount of points on the complex gamma plane that actually lie on that green circle. It seems like um, it's not going to be helpful to us in a general case. But, and this is very important, one of the most useful, perhaps the most useful um, aspect of a Smith chart, one of the most frequently um, uh, uh, implemented uh, tools of a Smith chart, is to transform a load, not into a specific value of input impedance, but transform a specific load to a value of input impedance which has a certain characteristic.
All right, if we go through and we specify both the real part of the input impedance and the imaginary part of the input impedance that we desire, we can only transform the load into that if that input impedance happens luckily to lie on that green circle of the reflection coefficient uh, parametric mapping. But let's say we only want to transform to one of those values. I want to transform my load impedance to an input impedance whose real value is a specific number, but whose imaginary can be anything. Or I want to transform the load impedance into an input impedance whose imaginary value has a certain uh, uh, number, but whose real part we don't care. It turns out that is a very useful uh, question to ask in many um, uh, microwave designs. We want to transform a load into a new impedance which has a certain characteristic with respect to either its real part or its imaginary part, but no, not both. And in that case, the, uh, this transformation uh, um, using a transmission line will be very, very helpful. Specifically, we might consider a case where we want to uh, use a length of transmission line, a length L of transmission line, to transform some arbitrary load impedance into an input impedance whose real part is equal to 1. And of course, this is the normalized real part, so what we're really saying in terms of ohms is we want to transform the load impedance into an input impedance whose real part is equal to Z0, the characteristic impedance. And this is a uh, operation um, that we ha do quite frequently in microwave engineering design to transform a load into one whose real part is numerically equal to Z0. What is the value of the reactance then under that transformation? In this case, we don't care. Again, we're saying we want the real part to be equal to, normalized real part to be equal to 1, and we don't care what the reactive part turns out to be for that transformation. In this case, there is frequently a design solution, much more frequently than if we try to specify both the real and imaginary part. Now, not in every case can we do this transformation. There are problems where we can find no length of transmission line, which will uh, convert certain load impedances into an input impedance uh, whose real value is equal to one, but oftentimes uh, we can. Alternatively, we might want to uh, use a length of transmission line to transfer, transform rather a load impedance, an arbitrary load impedance with both a non-zero real and imaginary part into an input impedance whose imaginary part is zero. In other words, a, an input impedance that is purely real. Purely real. It uh, uh, looks like a resistor uh, at the uh, designed frequency. And so again, this is an operation that we frequently, uh, frequently um, um, use in microwave design to transform an impedance into a new impedance that's purely real, essentially getting rid of the reactive component. Once again, there are many situations, because we limit ourselves to simply making the imaginary part equal to zero, where we can find the length of a transmission line which will transform some load into an input impedance that is purely real. However, there are loads always that cannot be transformed into um, an input impedance that is purely real. So sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, but generally speaking, or oftentimes, uh, we're able to uh, find a length that will accomplish this. So let's do a specific example. Let's say we have a load impedance, a real part of two, and an imaginary part of plus two. And the question we ask ourselves is, what should the length of a lossless transmission line be uh, in front of it that would transform this load impedance into an input impedance that is purely real, an input impedance whose imaginary part is equal to zero? So we can determine the answer to this question using the Smith uh, using the Smith using a Smith chart. We uh, first locate the uh, load impedance on the Smith chart at the intersection of the R equal to two contour circle and the uh, X equal to plus two circle. And then we take that point and we rotate rotate clockwise as we move away from the load back. Um, up the transmission line. We're rotating in a clockwise direction 
and we rotate using a circular arc, parametrically plotting gamma, and we rotate not until we bump into a certain electrical index on the outer scale that tells us to stop. In this case, we rotate until we intersect the x equal to zero contour. What we're doing is transforming our load into a new load whose reactance is equal to zero. Where are the impedances uh, whose reactance is equal to zero? Well, they're all on the contour on the uh, Smith chart uh, for the x equal to zero contour. When we get to that point, we stop. So when we stop, we reside on the complex gamma plane on the Smith chart at a location of an impedance whose reactance is equal to zero. We're on the contour of all impedances whose imaginary part is equal to zero. And so we have transformed our impedance uh, into one that is purely real. What is the real value? Well, we have to look at the Smith chart at the intersection of that point. What R equal to what contour of constant uh, resistance intersects that point? Who knows what it'll be? It might be less than one or greater than one. Um, that is the value then of your input impedance. You can't pick what value that is because you have constrained the solution to simply making the imaginary part equal to zero. Now, how long does that transmission line to be need to be? Well, you can determine that from your outer scale. How far did you rotate around? You started a point, you ended a point. Again, you draw lines through those points and look at your outer scale to see how far you moved in terms of number of wavelengths. Let's look at that graphically. All right, so we take our Smith chart, and first we find the location on the Smith chart for the uh, load in this example, a real part of two, an imaginary part of two. So this is the r equal to two circle that intersects that point, and this is the uh, x equal to plus two contour that intersects that point. So this is the point for the load. And then we parametric parametrically plot our reflection coefficient function. We start at that point and strike a circular arc. And so we're moving from our load back up the line, and because of that, we're rotating counterclockwise. How far do we rotate? Well, we rotate to the point where the impedance would have an imaginary part equal to zero. And we know where that point is by identifying first the x equal to zero contour. All of the points on the complex gamma plane that correspond to impedances whose real part is equal to, I'm sorry, imaginary part equal to zero. Uh, impedances that are purely real. And we know that contour is the horizontal axis of the complex gamma plane. That contour is the uh, real axis of the complex gamma plane. And so we rotate, take our compass, and we rotate around until we hit that contour x equal to zero. And we stop at that point. When we look, we find that point intersects, of course, the uh, that point is intersected, of course, by the x equal to zero contour, but it's also intersected by the uh, contour of constant resistance of 4.2. So in other words, we have transformed our original load impedance, which had both a real and an imaginary part, into a new input impedance whose imaginary part is zero. Notice the real part is not equal to 2, like the load impedance was. The real part has been transformed as well. It's 4.2. Again, it is what it is. You just have to accept whatever that value turns out to be. The question then becomes, from a design standpoint, is how long should the transmission line be to transform this load of 2 plus J2 into an input impedance that is purely real? Well, it's easy to determine from the Smith chart. Again, we draw a line from the center through the load impedance outward to our outer scale. We draw a line from the center of the Smith chart through our input impedance outward to the outer scale. We determine uh, one of the scale values, and we could use, use either one, wavelengths toward generator or wavelengths toward load. Mark the value there. Again, it doesn't really matter what the value is. has no significance. Mark the value here, denote it and then take the difference between those two values. Again, we need to be consistent if we either use both um, wavelengths toward generator uh, scale or use marks on the wavelength toward load scale. But if we take the difference of either one, and in fact, you might want to take the difference of both just to make sure that you have an answer that's consistent, we'll find that the difference between those 
um, uh, electrical uh, index values is going to be 0.042 lambda. In other words, the length of our transmission line needs to be 0.042. A transmission line of 0.042 will transform a load of 2 plus J2 into an input impedance of 4.2 real. Something that's quite interesting and very important to, uh, important to point out is that there is actually a second solution to this problem. We start at our load impedance and we rotate around counterclockwise, parametrically plotting the reflection coefficient function, and we stop when we get to the contour, which is x equal to zero. Notice, however, if we keep going, if we keep rotating, we rotate back around and we will again intersect that contour. And so there are two solutions to the problem. We either rotate this distance around the complex gamma plane, the Smith chart, corresponding to a short length of transmission line, or we can rotate around halfway again, adding another half wavelength onto the length of that transmission line. I'm sorry, quarter wavelength rather, onto the length of that transmission line. And when we get to that end, when we stop, we find that the um, um, uh, value uh, for the input impedance now is 0.24 plus J0. And so we have two choices for our design. We can either use an input impedance transformed to an input impedance of 4.2 plus J0 or 0.24 plus J0. Which one do we choose? Well, it depends on a couple of things. Do you want the resistive, the you made your input impedance purely resistive, uh, reaction or uh, the imaginary part is equal to zero. But do you want the resistive component to be greater than one, larger than Z zero, or less than one, smaller than Z zero? If you don't care, <clears throat> then you could uh, perhaps choose either one. Notice mathematically, and this is always the case, if I take the inverse of of uh, 0.24, 1 over 0.24, I get a value of 4.2, which is the real part of our first solution. And that is always the case. If we have a situation where the real part is equal to 3 for our first solution, we'll find the real part for our second solution is going to be equal to 1 third, for example. Now, Another thing to keep in mind that's interesting here is let's say we wanted to transform our load impedance into uh, input impedance whose imaginary part was not zero, but whose imaginary part was, let's say, three. Here is the x equal to three contour right here. We follow it around. We'd like to go through and then start here and rotate it around until we intersect that, intersect that x equal to 3 contour. But notice that circle never will intersect the x, intersect the x equal to 3 contour. For this problem, where we want to transform uh, a load value of 2 plus J2 into a uh, input impedance whose um, input impedance whose imaginary part is equal to 3, um, there is uh, no solution. There are two solutions if we want to transform it to x equal to 0, but there's no solution uh, if we want to transform it to x uh, equal uh, to 3. Same thing for other values of uh, reactants, x equal to minus 3 or uh, minus 5 and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so forth. Oh, one other thing in terms of the two solutions um, uh, that we choose between. Again, we can use a solution with a short length of transmission line to give us a value of 4.2 real, or we can use that short distance plus another quarter wavelength uh, to give us a real part of 0.24. Generally speaking, in microwave engineering, if we have a choice between a short a solution with a shorter length of transmission line or a longer 
length of transmission line, we choose the solution with the shorter length. One, of course, is it takes up less space, but perhaps more importantly we'll find is that solution has a wider bandwidth. As we change our frequency, as the value of lambda changes, then of course our input impedance will change. And the shorter the length of the transmission line, the less sensitive it is to changes in frequency. The wider the bandwidth the solution will be. So a rule of thumb in microwave engineering is if I have two different solutions to achieve the same thing, in this case an input impedance that is purely uh, real, um, choose the solution that requires the shorter length of transmission line. So let's do um, a different situation. We're going to start with the same load as we had before, but now we want to uh, find a length of trans uh, length, the proper length of transmission line that will transform that load into an input impedance whose, uh, in this case, real value is specified. The real value is equal to 1. The resistance then in ohms would be numerically equal to Z0. Well, same procedure really as before. We go through and find our location on the Smith chart for this impedance. We parametrically plot the reflection coefficient from that value of, of gamma L. So we strike a circular arc rotating clockwise, clockwise along the reflection coefficient, uh, the, the complex gamma plane. And we rotate now until we strike the contour, which is defined as r equal to 1. We look for the r equal to 1 circle on our Smith chart, and we rotate now a clockwise direction until we strike that r equal to 1 circle. When we hit that r equal to 1 circle, that when we stop rotating. That's when we know we have found an impedance whose real part is equal to 1. What is the imaginary part? Well, we simply have to pick up our pencil and look at our uh, the intersection of that point with our contour of constant uh, reactance to see what that value will be. So the question is, what is the design solution? What is the length of the transmission line which will transform that impedance into an input impedance whose real part is equal to 1? Again, Smith chart's pretty simple. We write two, strike two lines uh, through ZL uh, at the beginning and ZN at the end. We look at the uh, outer scale uh, values and use the um, uh, electrical uh, uh, index there and simply take the difference between those two and that will tell, tell us how far we need to travel uh, back up our transmission line to the beginning to transform our load impedance of 2 plus J2 into an input impedance whose real part is equal to 1. Like before, we'll find there are actually two solutions to this problem because we can strike the circle r equal to 1 twice as we parametrically plot our reflection coefficient function on the complex gamma plane. So uh, here's the graphical uh, example of our first solution. We start at our load of uh, 2 plus J2 and then we parametrically plot the reflection coefficient. That's the uh, uh, blue line or blue contour here, the uh, circular arc, and we rotate clockwise and we rotate down until we strike the r equal to 1 circle. So we rotate down and we hit that point right here. We pick up our pencil and we see that that point intersects with the minus 1.6 impedance, constant impedance contour. Look down here, it says plus 1.6, but we know it's minus because it's down here in the capacitive region of the complex gamma plane. And so we have transformed our load impedance from a real part of 2 and an imaginary part of plus 2 into an input impedance now at the other end of the transmission line, which has a real part of 1. That's what we were seeking, a real part of 1. And the imaginary part happens to be minus 1.6. Again, that's not necessarily what we wanted one way or the other. It just turns out to be the value we get when we transform our load impedance into an input impedance whose real part is equal to 1. What is the length of that transmission line? What is our design solution? It's easily determined from the Smith chart. We take our straight edge and draw a line from the center through ZL 
to the outer scale and note the value of our electrical index, either in the wavelength toward generator or wavelength toward load, it doesn't matter. We can pick either one as long as we're consistent. And then we take our input impedance value and we draw a straight line through it to the outer scale. And then we take the difference between the outer scale electrical value here, again, a meaningless number, and the value here, again, a meaningless number, but the difference between the two are very important. The difference between the two in this case we'll find is 0 0.114, 0 0.114 lambda. That needs to be the length of our transmission line, and that will transform a load impedance of 2 plus J2 into an input impedance of 1 minus J1.6. But that's just one solution. There is a second solution. So once we rotate around our complex, again, we're parametrically plotting the reflection coefficient, we rotate around and we strike the r equal to 1 contour right here at this point, and we could stop, but we could continue to rotate. And what we're doing is moving back up the transmission line, uh, making the uh, line length longer and longer as we rotate around. And finally, we come back around and we strike the r equal to 1 contour a second time. We pick up our pencil and we find that the impedance associated with that reflection input reflection coefficient point is an impedance of 1 plus uh, j 1.6. The real part is 1. That's what we desired. The imaginary part is plus 1.6. Again, we didn't specify that. It just turns out to be that way. Interestingly, we find that uh, this solution is uh, the complex conjugate of our first solution. In our first case, when we were down here, we found the input impedance was 1 minus J1.6. In our second solution, we find it's J1 plus uh, 1 plus j 1.6. And so the two solutions are related by complex conjugate. Which solution should we choose? Well, if you have a preference on reactants, if you like it of the inductive variety or the capacitive variety, you might choose one or the other, positive or negative. If it is no consequence to you, whether it's inductive or capacitive, then certainly you would choose the first solution in this case because it has a much shorter transmission line length. If we go through and find the transmission line length for the second solution, again, we draw a line through here and mark this index and draw a line through here and mark this index, then we determine then the total length. And it's important you be very careful here to take these two values and determine the rotation length all the way around in terms of electrical length. You can look at this and see that it needs to be something close to 0.5 or rotate almost all the way around the Smith chart. And you have to kind of go through, since we cross the, uh, the state line here where the index starts again, you need to go through and determine the length from here to here. And then, excuse me, and then once again, the length from here back to here. We know it's a value that's going to be close to 0.5. Think about the Sandy check. We get a value of 0.71 lambda. Well, 0.71, that's pretty close to 0.5. That seems correct given what we've done. Oftentimes, students will look at this index and this index, and they'll take the distance, the difference between the two, and instead of specifying the length being this all the way around, they'll specify the distance being simply this. 0.5 minus 4.7, or around 0 0.03. 0 0.03 doesn't even uh, pass the Sandy check. That's a very short electrical length, and look how far we've rotated around the Smith chart to get the list location. We know we're going to have a value, something close to 0.5. Make sure numerically, when you get your answer, that indeed it is. So. Um, uh, uh, pick up on the Sandy check. Again, from a standpoint of a solution, we'd probably pick solution one because this transmission line length for solution two is so long. One last point. If we look at this impedance, ZL, that we have here, and let's say we want to transform it into a input impedance whose real value, let's say, is equal to uh, uh, point, uh, point 0.1. Well, in that case, here is the point 0.1 circle. It's kind of hard to see, but the point 0.1 circle, the contour of constant resistance of point 0.1, is this circle here. Notice our parametric plot will never intersect that circle, which means there is no solution, which means we cannot transform a load of 2 plus J2 into an input impedance whose resistance, uh, uh, input resistance has a value of point 0.1. Or correspondingly, if we look over here at this circle, this has a value 
of 4, r equal to 4. Notice the parametric plot, this blue circle never intersects the r equal to 4 contour, and therefore we cannot transform the impedance 2 plus j2 into an input impedance whose real part is equal to 4. There is no solution. However, if we wanted to transform our load impedance into an input impedance whose um, uh, value is, uh, let's say, uh, r equal to 1.4, uh, six, and that would be the circle right here. Notice there are two two solutions for that. We can find two solutions there. Or if we want to transform a load impedance into an input impedance whose real part is equal to, let's say, 0.5. All right, there is the r equal to 0.5 circle that uh, follows there. Notice the uh, parametric plot of reflection coefficient intersects the r equal to 0.5 circle there, and likewise the r equal to 0.5 circle there. So there are two solutions then for that problem. As I said, there are some problems where we transport certain loads to certain input impedances with certain characteristic impedances that where we can transform. There is a solution, a length of line that will do that. Usually there are two solutions. Or there are load impedances where we want to transform to an input impedance of a certain characteristic, uh, certain characteristic uh, where there are no solutions. Now, in this case, we've been talking about transforming um, load impedances into input impedances of certain characteristics, the real part equal to 1, the imaginary part equal to 0, or again, we could have said the real part equal to 2, or the imaginary part of, of, of minus 0.6, and, and didn't done the similar kind of uh, uh, operation. But we could also go through and do a transformation from a load into an input impedance whose input reflection coefficient has a value of, let's say, 0.2 or 0.8, or in terms of one whose load uh, input reflection uh, uh, angle uh, is a certain value. And that's the one that actually has a solution there. If we go through and we uh, uh, take a line from the center outward, that corresponds to a certain load reflection angle. And we could always rotate around until we hit that contour and solve a problem in that way.